Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra, and there has been a lot going on, like a lot. And it's been really crazy and really fun. And because of that, I kind of just want to get right into it today. So first, some quick reminders for the show. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. Believe in Softball is also on YouTube, so subscribe. And the video is pretty cool. I keep saying it. It's true. You just get a little bit more out of that channel. Some cool additions. All right, let's go through today's batting order. First, we'll cover our bases, give you some news and call-outs from around the softball world. Then we'll head into today's interview with Amy Hogue, Utah's fearless leader, who I have just loved getting to know over the last couple of seasons through covering her on Pac-12 Networks, and she just has good energy that I'm excited to, to share with you all. And then we'll end things with the foul tip of the week, the tips to help us keep going and get better. All right, let's get started. Covering our bases. Our partners at BetOnline continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, including updated odds on the NBA playoffs, fights, and even next season's futures. And don't forget that the MLB is back as well. Who are you picking to win the World Series? BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It's super easy to get started, so head to the website today or use your mobile device to join and use our promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. But one of the things that's exciting in terms of big picture is AUX is going to be in SoCal. So we knew this. Athletes Unlimited having their condensed supplemental season right after the World Series, basically, in June. And this is before and separate. It's just like a couple weeks. Their third season which will be the full season in Rosemont in August. So that'll be similar to what we've been used to, but this will be that shortened version early on. So we knew this and we knew it was going to come to San Diego, but now we know that it's going to be at San Diego State. They're hosting it. And we said this last week, this was the team to watch for us last week. And they did, by the way, go on to win that UNLV series in Vegas, first in the Mountain West. So I have to say congrats to Stacey Newman and her team. But it's really cool that they're doing these things kind of beyond just the typical college season. It is big time to host something like this back on the West Coast. California is such a hotbed for softball talent, especially in SoCal. And everything, most of the time, is on Eastern or Central time zones. Like, that's just how it is. That's how it works, just with geography, right? Like in the U.S. And that's what gets a lot of coverage. But we really want this thing, like, and by this thing, I mean softball, right? And women's sports, This we want this to be coast to coast. So to have this kind of presence, and then yes, they'll go back to Rosemont and be back on that central time, right? Like in the Chicago area, great. Like to have both, I think is really good. And it's no surprise really to me with the coaching staff that's at San Diego State. I mean, with Victoria Hayward, the first ever player to sign with Athletes Unlimited, Olympian with Team Canada, Rachel Garcia, the volunteer assistant coach, UCLA legend, national champion, all everything, right? And then Stacey Newman again, <laughs> Olympian, just one of the best to ever play uh, behind the dish. And they essentially bring that like big time mentality. They're like a mid-major program with power five ambitions and they're making moves accordingly. And it's, it's exciting. I, I like to see that. But then things are shaken up a bit. So while Athletes Unlimited is shaking things up a little with their condensed AUX season, so are the conferences in college softball. There have just been some crazy series recently. I was on the call all weekend for UCLA at Stanford. And let me tell you just what a three games that we got to witness. Stanford took game two and three, if you didn't see it, to win the series for the first time since 2013. So it's been nine years since they did this with UCLA. But what I want to make really clear, like this was something I was thinking about afterwards. And I, I feel it's important to highlight This is not a sign of weakness from UCLA, but rather a show of strength from Stanford. To me, UCLA is still a top five team in the country, easily. I think it's evident with what they've been able to do so far this season. The 25-game win streak, the 10-0 start to Pac-12, statistically having one of, if not the best pitching staff in the nation, that is all still there. And you better believe they're working on things in the cage this week, right? They got shut out twice. They're not used to that. But they are still elite. And I think what everybody learned this weekend, some people already knew it, right? But what everyone else learned is that Stanford is right there. 
competing. Elena Vodder is also one of the best pitchers in the country. She's now leading the Pac-12 in wins. It was like her and Faremo kind of tied there at the top. Well, this took her over the edge. She threw 15 innings. She got the series clinching W on Sunday. And then she finally got some of that recognition with Pac-12 and National Pitcher of the Week honors. But this just shows that Stanford can compete. And I have to give credit, too, to Reagan Krause and Tatum Boyd for the first win in the series, too. The pitching staff, not just Elena Vodder, but her being the ace, is fantastic. Like, this shows they should have been in the top 25 rankings all along. Now, they're finally in all five of the polls, as they should be. And this is, what, four top 25 wins on the year for them? No one else in the entire season was able to shut out UCLA. Stanford does it in back-to-back games. This is not a fluke. And look who UCLA has played this year, right? They obviously beat almost everyone they played, but even their losses, they played OU, they played Florida State, they played Northwestern. None of them shut them out like Stanford did. So again, credit to the entire pitching staff and the defense for Stanford as well. Both really came through when they needed it. And I think really the bigger picture here too is like this shows what the Pac-12 is. When I saw Kelly Inouye Perez after game one, when they won an extra innings, they took that first game from Stanford. She was like, man, you know, welcome to the Pac-12, right? Like that was her reaction. The gap between what was the top of the pack and what was the bottom of the pack has closed. And it's changed. Like who is in those categories has changed. And I, so again, I just had to call this out because I think it applies kind of across the board in different conferences and on the national stage. It's just give credit where it's due. It's a credit to Stanford, not a quote unquote deduction from UCLA that this happened. For example, last year, this is why James Madison used to hate when people would call them the Cinderella story last year in the Women's College World Series. No, they had been killing it all season long. They only had two losses on the entire season before the World Series. Okay, so anyway, just give credit to the right people. You know, that's that's where I'm at there. But just some craziness all around the country, really. I mean, that Virginia Tech, Florida State series was pretty insane. The Seminoles lost that series, too. So some of these, like, top three, top five teams lost some series, right? And some insane numbers, too, at that 23-9 to game in the second game of the weekend. Of course, there was a lot of controversy over the leaping rule and calling that versus it's not consistent. And I agree. This has been something all season. We just need consistency. It's a rule. It's in place. So it's there, right? It needs to be followed, but it needs to be consistent. Like we need to either call it all the time or don't call it at all. We got to figure this out. But just seeing how many people cared and were just engaged in that whole conversation on social media and just in general, it was an indication of the attention softball is getting to me and the conference as well in the ACC. So that part of it was some silver lining that I thought was, was interesting. And just the fact that the ACC, you know, they've had Florida State for a while, right? Since the 2018 National Championship, they have truly been on that stage. But the rise of Virginia Tech and Duke and Clemson, like it's exciting for that conference. And then we had some classics too, like the Alabama-Florida series. The Tide took the series, obviously, but the crazy inning in Game 3 gave that game to the Gators. And it's just been a wild SEC conference slate so far, to say the least. And you see Arkansas at the top of the SEC standings as of right now. Kentucky right behind Alabama at number three. And I will tell you, like, it wasn't too long ago in previous years where those two would have been a lot further down on that list. So overall, it's just really exciting to see the growth. You know, you look at Power 5 teams rising in their conferences to mid-majors who are stepping up and just everything. I think it's just good growth for the sport. It's what we like to see. And someone else who knows about growth for the sport is today's guest. So let's head into the interview. She is the Utah head coach, Hall of Famer, 2015 Pac-12 Coach of the Year, Utes record holder, and All-American player, Amy Hogue. Coach, I am super excited to talk to you today. (laughs) Cool. Thanks for that intro. That was nice. Yeah, right? Been here a long time. So yeah. (laughs) Yep. I like to give like the confidence boost, you know, with the intros. Rather than the score of the last game or whatever, because that's not always favorable. Well, I like it. I mean, everything I said is a fact, though, right? It's just a reminder more than anything. It's true. <laughs> yep. Well, I have to ask you, too, how is it being home right now? It's been, you know, on the road a lot for you guys. Yeah. And even though we do it every year and we should be used to it, 
the older I get, the grumpier I am about it. It's hard. You know, we always play the first 25 to 30 games on the road. And I like traveling. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do this job. And it's part of our recruiting, actually, strategy is, you know, there's a lot of young women that live in Arizona or California that we're recruiting that don't travel very much in their, even on their travel ball teams, they don't travel. They play right there. And so some of them really want to travel. And if they go play at a lot of the other schools, even in the PAC 12, they won't travel as much as us. So obviously in the pack, we all take four trips on the road and have four at home, but not every team travels, you know, five trips outside of that, except for us. So um, anyway, it's a recruiting strategy, but yet you're right. Like it, by the time we get to be at home, it's almost awkward. Um, a little bit. I, I counted with my daughter the other day, we had like 18 nights. I was in my same bed at home and it was, it was getting weird. It was like, I was getting the itch to go to the airport, but yeah, we'll, we're home this weekend and we alternate home and away the rest of the go. So the next six weeks in a row is one home, one away. So it won't be 18 in a row again, but we did that stretch um, right before we went to Stanford last weekend. And it was nice. Got a rhythm at home, but it's different. We're used to the other. Of course. But I will say it is beautiful there. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I've lived here since I was in sixth grade. So I, because I travel a lot, I don't take it for granted. I think if I didn't travel a lot, um, then I'm sure I would just be so used to it. But I go other places, I enjoy my time, and I love coming home. Yeah. I was super excited because I think I might have mentioned this to you when we chatted before one of your series this year, but my senior year was the first year that you guys were in the pack. And so Mm -hmm. I was really excited, though, because we were playing at Utah that year. So I actually, before I graduated, got to go to Utah to play which, you know, some, not everybody did who were ever seniors that year. And it was so pretty, like just seeing all the mountains in the background. And I also was lucky because we went in May. I think it was the last weekend of mm-hmm. Pac-12. So it could not have been a better time to be there. Yeah, sometimes we'll get snow in May, but usually May is a pretty good bet for some good weather and and even some snow in the mountains. So it's beautiful, but still 60 or 70 down here on the field. So yeah, it's it's beautiful, and they built our stadium up on the top of campus, so the view on the backside of the stadium um, at sunset, it, it's tough to get anybody in the stands, their attention down on the field, because they're all looking towards the sunset, and it's the best place in the valley to see the sunset, too, so um, yeah, it's, it's a great place to call home. I remember you saying too that it almost helped your recruiting because everybody that would come would be like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful here. And they'd post it on social media and people would see it. And it's like, oh, well, this this makes Utah look great. <laughs> right. Yeah, we didn't have to do a lot of, you know, bragging on it ourselves because we just had to retweet what <laughs> Stanford said that year. And everyone's first time here is that kind of a, wow, look at this. And so, yeah, we just copied and pasted or or retweeted or whatever your language is on that social media world that I'm not familiar with. Um, and it was helpful. So thank you to all of you that did that for us. Oh yeah. But it is getting more crowded here. Um, it's getting tougher to find a place to live because it's the words out for sure. It's, we hosted the 2002 Olympics and it was for the whole world to see. And, you know, with everything going on in the last, you know, even 10 years, um, it's tough to retire in California. So they're all my neighbors now are from California and uh, it's getting a little crowded, but yeah, secrets out. Actually, I think not too far away. Some of maybe your extended neighbors are one of my old teammates, Ashley Hansen was part of that group who came from California with her husband and her family and moved to Salt Lake city. So part of the problem maybe, but also like they're excited about it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, because I already had a home here, it's fine for me because when I want to sell it, it's going to be worth a lot. But sure. it's it's getting tough for to bring in, like my two assistant coaches, Paige and DJ, are trying to find a place to live um, rather than just an apartment, you know, maybe buy a house or a condo. And it's tough. It's tough right now. So it's just slim pickings. Um, 
So, cause everyone's moving in, not out. Yeah. I can relate to the cost of living situation in the Bay area for sure. But it's one of those things, I guess, but you mentioned your staff and I, um, was super excited to talk to you about them throughout this Pac-12 conference play so far when I've had the chance to talk to you. And I loved just your idea basically of bringing in different perspectives. Like Paige is, is fantastic. Like having done what she's done at Oklahoma. And then you obviously had DJ last year and he's back and chip, like it's just such a cool group that you have now leading the Utes. Yeah. It's fun too. And they are the ones leading the youths. They're, they're the ones that really have rolled up their sleeves and are in with the athletes every day. And I kind of manage the staff and it's a different role for me. I'm not going to lie. I'm not sure if I love that, but I have too much at my fingertips with the three of them to, to not let them, you know, really, you know, give all the input. And I, I pretty much come in and they have already, um, planned the practice and I help troubleshoot some of the, you know, issues that I think that we'll see with rotations or we don't have a shortstop if you do it that way, or the timing here, it's never really 40 minutes. You are going to show them film and it will take, you know, 55 minutes, you know, at best, like stuff that they, they need guidance for sure because they're new at it, but they are on fire for this coaching role. And the last thing I want to do is get in their way or try to micromanage any of that. So, um, stepping back and letting them step in and, um, it has been fun. I think it's last year. It was a lot for DJ with his first year. So this year is, um, he's, he's learned so much because I let him swim in it a little bit said, they're yours. I want him to score a lot of runs, go, you know, and not tell him how to do everything was different for him. And yet all I had to do is just encourage him and give him the space and, and it was, it's been great. So he's settling in more and then Paige being in her first year and Chip in her first year, it's, um, you know, helping them learn who it is they want to be as a coach rather than a player is a fun role that I get to have as the person that oversees that and helps develop that. And, um, there's, there's hard days though. I mean, when Paige can't grab the ball and go show him how to do it, you know, uh, or chip can't grab a bat and, um, just say, this is how it's done. You know, they can in practice, but in the game, it's on the players and, um, you know, to them, they've done it. They know how it's supposed to look and be done. So, you know, everyone has to learn a lot of patience at this level. And that's what I feel like I've had a ton of because I've had a lot of practice in that. So I get to model a lot of those things and help grow them. It's, I have a great role. It's just different for me. So I'm trying to settle in and, and love it as much as what I've always done in the past, like call pitches and, and, you know, run the offense, but it's fun. It's a fun transition. Well, it was really refreshing to hear you talk about, like as somebody who's been part of the Utah family for so long as a player, as a coach, like to hear you talk about the idea of, you know what? Yeah, we needed some new energy. We wanted some new perspectives like Paige Parker's perspective from Oklahoma on the pitching side, DJ Gasso's as well on the hitting side, and then Chip from UCLA and, and with the outfielders in particular. I remember you saying like the outfielders, you kind of like they sort of just had whoever was available before coaching them. And now they have someone who played out there. Right. And, but just the mindset of you even having that, that thought process of like being open to new things, uh, especially having been doing it a certain way and had success that way. Right. Is refreshing. Cause not everyone's like that. Yeah. I actually, everyone should be like that. That's the best way. And I'm lucky, I guess, that I'm naturally like that. I mean, I, I, I'm I, sure that early on in my career, I wasn't a ton like that, but it doesn't work very well. Um, I've been an assistant coach before. I've been in some of those roles where it's like, hey, I have a lot to offer. And, um, you know, and that confidence coming in and so much you want to say. And so it would be wrong of me, I think, to get in their way of that. And especially when we need 
young coaches. We need some that have the love and the desire and the energy for it. Um, I don't want to slow them down. And by saying, nope, this is how you do it. Because they came from programs, UCLA and Oklahoma, that do nothing but win games. And I'm the one that gets to adjust and learn and grow um, and just allow space for that. And, you know, there's very little black and white in this game. And I've learned that um, because I've been here long enough and I've had programs that have won games that had not a single superstar on the field. And then I've had, you know, years where we won um, with, you know, a handful of all conference players. So um, it's, but the bottom line is what do you have and what, who are they as athletes and people and how do we as a group go win ball games together and, and have fun, you know, you can't just do the work. You've got to have some fun too. So, and these guys like to work. This coaching staff is they're workers and they're competitive. And so I didn't have to try to, you know, talk them into caring or working hard. I just had to try to start to understand what they came from and what they think is going to help this group win, knowing I'm the only one that knows what we have. You know, they walked in and said, now who's who and where do they like to hit it? And are they power kids or fast kids or what? And so they needed me. They still need me, but they, they have lots of good ideas and I help us to put it together. Right. I, I definitely benefited from having like different types of relationships with the different coaches on the staff when I played. And it's, it was a good reminder for me too. Like, cause you know, obviously when we do these like pre broadcast calls with the coaches, we're focused on the players, right? So much. Cause that's what we're going to be talking about during the game most of the time. But it was a good reminder talking to you, what all the head coach really does. It's everything in the program, which also means developing not just the players, but the coaches too, and managing that talent. Like there are a lot of layers that I think is, are easy to forget when you just see the product on the field. Yeah. Yeah. And I had Cody here for so long and then Maggie prior to that for so long. And, and even a volunteer coach in Russ Paskins for so long, like, um, it, it becomes less of something that you talk about just because you have, um, people that have been here for so long, but to bring in a new staff, like I have, I mean, things were going to shift and they needed to shift and it's been fun to talk about it again. And especially as we're trying to develop a little bit of a rhythm within, you know, the four of us. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it was one of the the interesting parts. Um, well, one of many <laughs> in our conversations that we've had over, over time. And I know something you said last year that has stuck with me because I've always liked your energy. And I remember you saying that you've never been afraid of hard also. And that almost like you would leave other situations maybe in your life in the past because it wasn't hard enough, <laughs> right? Like you just thrive on that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's where you grow, right? You grow when you get into the hard. And I was always wanting to grow. I wasn't, uh, not that anything I left was ever easy. I mean, uh, you're referring to a conversation we had about my job prior to this as a you know, a head coach at a junior college. It was exactly what I needed. And at the same time, I found myself um, kind of stalling, you know, where I was like, I didn't feel overextended. And, and I had two baby boys and, you know, this head coaching gig for the first time. But I, I wanted the game to challenge me. And I, I wasn't finding it difficult enough and I was finding myself having a hard time leaving the babies at home to go do a job that didn't challenge me enough. So if I'm going to leave them, I would like to have it consume me at work because that's how I'm wired, I guess. So it was, it was, you know, I took, took a step back and actually stayed home with the kids for a little bit and then planned and had our third. And then I've had this job since my baby girl was one. So I had a six year old, a four year old and one year old. And, uh, and we were in the mountain West conference when I took the job, but we were picked to take last that year. And I had one incoming pitcher, no returning pitching. And I thought, Oh, yep, this is hard. Yep. Signed up for that with three little ones. And 
you know, pick to take last and to develop that program to be one that was in contention to win the Mountain West and then to then become a Pac-12, you know, got invited to that and started at the bottom again. And I thought, golly, I signed up for hard and I'm getting it. So, um, and then single mom thing presented itself when I had a ninth grader, a seventh grader and, and a fourth grader. So it was a lot. So, and again, I do believe I thrive better in that, you know, realm. So it's been hard and it's going to continue to be hard. It's, this game is, every program's getting better. It's hard to win against anybody. Um, and I love it. It's, it's wearing me out. I'm getting old. I turned 50 this year and it's, um, it takes a lot out of you. And these kids deserve a certain amount from you. So you talk about the energy and, um, I don't want them to have some old coach that can't, you know, wake up and get excited like they do on game days. Cause I'm expecting them to. So, um, I won't keep doing it if I can't get up and enjoy it the way I used to. I just won't. They deserve better. So um, bringing in this young coaching staff, you know, 28, 27, and 26 years old or whatever they are, it was perfect. You know, they kind of lead the way in some of that and and uh, we just kind of bounce off of each other and make sure this team gets everything they deserve. Well, your energy too. I love the fact that so you can just see it right on the field, which I love, but it's not just like for the really big things. It's sometimes when something smaller is executed really well too. Like this past weekend, I had the chance to call your games right against Stanford. And I saw you, one of the most excited I think I saw you was when someone laid down a beautiful bunt, right? And they got on base because they put pressure on the defense and moved the runner over, right? And that's like when you were fired up and seeing that, and then you see that triple play that you guys, you know, were able to execute against Oklahoma and you're like coming out of the dugout so pumped up. I told you this, I think before, like I loved that because, you know, it's not just about the home runs, right? It's like when we execute something really, really well. And I, I, I guess I get fired up by your appreciation of that. Yeah, I have so much respect for this game and for what it, uh, what these young women put in in order to have those things happen and if it's not going to hit the papers because that bunt didn't hit the papers, but I know that it is the reason why we scored a run that inning or whatever, then I, I like to point those things out. I think they changed games. I think that as a player, that's all I did was the little things. I didn't do anything big. So it was, it's just another person that has an eye on an appreciation of a small thing. And I think that, um, you know, DJ coaches hitters to hit home runs and those kids will get in the paper and Paige, you know, is getting them to double digit strikeouts and that'll get in the paper. But I feel like Chip and I are both the ones that are um, just get fired up for those little things because we were those type of players and they make a difference in our game. And they made a difference in that last series at Stanford. So we talked about it a lot, how those little things are going to become big things because well, pitching staffs are are tough. And so it might not even take a hit. It might take a walk and a stolen base and a, you know, just a ground ball. The, the second baseman is how we got beat on the, on Sunday. So the series was one, not even on a hit. It was just a trader run for an out ground ball to the right side with one out and a runner at third. So those are the things that get me fired up because those are the things that tend to go unnoticed and I won't let it happen because if you're going to say they're that important and you're going to practice it as much as we do, then we need to get fired up and do some pointing and rushing. We read that um, Wolfpack book by Abby Wombach and, and a lot of pointing and rushing those kids has become kind of what our theme is this year is make sure those things get pointed out and we rush those kids that are um, doing those little things. I think that's so important. So important. Cause you're right. We say certain things, right. But it's one thing to actually live it and to show it when they happen. Like, Oh yeah. A walk's as good as a hit or this or that. And, but if we're not <laughs> reacting that way, you know, it's like the reinforcement's important. And even just for young ones watching, right. Like to understand what matters in the game. Right. 
Yep. Yeah, I don't think you guys are ever after a game going to pick that kid to interview, which is why they need to just be pointed out more in the inner circle. Yeah. And those those kids know their value. And they one of the kids we're highlighting this week, I just did the Pac-12 Network interview because we're on TV this weekend against Cal. And and they says, who do you want to talk about? And I said, Allie Velarde, because she isn't a kid that is crossing people's desks to want to talk about. And yet every time she comes up, even in a strikeout effort the other day, I mean, I'm asking her to take a ton of pitches so that we can run on a change up or one of those low ones in the dirt that happens to happen about every third pitch on this pitcher, you know? So I'm asking her to get deep in the count and then fight through so that we can steal second. And then she can, in a one, two count, put a ball on the ground and get her to third. Um, because if I've got Denny up, she doesn't hit the ball deep enough to score anyone from even second sometimes. So I need her on third. And so her job becomes, how do I manufacture, you know, how do I work hard to get that kid to third? And Bellardi will strike out and feel like I did nothing. I'm like, no, you, you stayed alive in that count long enough to draw a walk, or you stayed in that count long enough to get that runner to second. And then that little dinky, ground ball you did got her to third and then the kid that gets the sack fly you know that's who you interview but it's not who I recognize as the most important kid and she did nothing but you know fielder's choice or sack bunt and and pick up every ground ball at second so I'm like we need to start talking about those kids so we talked about her a lot this morning in the interview good I'm glad I think that's so important and I remember you mentioning her in particular too in terms of you used to get on her a lot you know, last year and, and before, because you knew you that it, that you'd need her this year. And I remember you saying yeah. you're joking around like, hey, is it nice to kind of have me off your butt a little bit? <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, I mean, the kids always feel like they're when they get that much attention from me, it's like, how come she's on me so much? And, and some of the older players say that's actually good. That means she has big plans for you and has a big role for you. And so she wants to school you as quick as she can. And so, which is true. I mean, she's playing second base. That was my spot. I'm pretty particular about how it's done. And, you know, she has big shoes to fill, you know, the best player we've ever had here, Hannah Flippin played it. And, and then Maddie Jacobus played it and she's replacing her because of an injury. So she played a little bit last year, but I knew I was going to need her to be ready. And, and she is ready. And you're right. I'm kind of off her butt a little bit now and on somebody else. But uh, she um, she responded well. She's just one of those kids that you just, you know, especially these young kids, they come in and you need to coach them up. The game is very different where they came from. They um, played a lot of games, but they didn't learn about competing or some of the toughness maybe isn't quite there when they show up. So um, and some of these little things in the game for sure aren't talked about enough. So, and she's one of my best base runners and she's never slapped before, but has a real natural ability to get down the line. So we added some things to her game and yeah, she was coached up a lot and she's having a really good year. I mean, I didn't expect her to become a new slapper and bat over 300 and, and do what she's doing at second base. And I, she's, she's definitely um, succeeding beyond what I thought at this point. I'm with you. I think those are the types of stories that are the most interesting and actually the most relatable too. Like, obviously we love talking about the Hannah Flippins of the world because how can you not? <laughs> right. But also, you know, sometimes when it's not like the easiest for somebody and then they just keep climbing and keep chipping away and really accomplish something like that, that is impressive and you can't help but respect it. Yeah. Yep. And those kids, I mean, every one of them's from out of state. We have one local player. So to come in and be expected to play a role that big after just moving here and COVID year, senior year was in your house in California and freshman year was in your dorm here in Utah. And it's like these kids are expected to do the same things that the kids in years past are expected to do. And that's why, you know, I think physically she she had the ability, but again, they just didn't gain the tools that normal freshmen had gained by then. And so I was really proud of her pushing through and becoming, um, someone that we could rely on and trust, um, with the start that she had with just hadn't even been out of her 
room for two years. And then now she's kind of starting to really get it. And it, she's been fun to watch for sure. Yeah. I think your exact quote last week was that she's been playing a mean second base, which I loved, yeah. loved to hear. Yeah. Yeah. She's actually got a little poison in her eyes. She's actually got a little spice and you need that. That's a tough position and uh, can't be soft. You're going to be asked to do a lot, go a lot of different directions. And I don't, I don't just have the same kid cover steel every time in all the situations. So there's a lot of times where she's got two jobs. She's supposed to cover the steel and the bunt and that's, that's tough. And she's, she's doing it. She's getting real tough. You just hit on something that I think is a good reminder for everybody too, because in a lot of ways, my opinion as a former infielder, Second base is the hardest infield position for that reason, not shortstop. Yes, you put, you know, typically one of your best or your best defenders at shortstop with an arm, all that good stuff. But with all the coverages and things that you have to do mentally at second base, it's not easy. Yeah, that's how we coach it. That's I've always put my best athlete over there um, or my best brain even. You know, Hannah was such a coach and – she came in as a shortstop. Anissa came in as a third baseman, and I shifted them over. and And I think people thought I was nuts putting Hannah at second. And she's capable of playing anywhere in the infield. But I need my most coach like brain over at second, um, because I think a lot of the decisions on who's covering what and where I need to be to do all my things is the one that determines which defense we're in, not necessarily the shortstop. So um, I like my brain over there um, and my good feet over there and maybe my little better arm at short, but um, my brain and my feet over at second. So it's worked out good. bilardi has got a lot to learn as far as um, how the game is run, but um, so did Hannah. I mean, she didn't know. And I was still bossing where, who's covering for a while. And then it was like, you know, I think it maybe after a one full year, I never called a coverage after that. Hannah and Anissa took care of it. So, and I feel like those two up the middle are to that point right now. So they're getting there anyway. I mean, that those are, that's a, that's meaningful to say that, to compare them to, to those two, because I, mean, I got to tell you, Hannah and Anissa have both been on the show too. And they're both mm-hmm. phenomenal people, like just kind, but also have that edge competitively also. Right. And I love how much they love defense because I'm a defensive purist. I know you love defense, right? Like it matters. And just to watch them still get to play up the middle together occasionally, like an athletes unlimited too, has been awesome. Yeah, they um, they were a joy to coach, but I think that they – I don't know if they both came in as people that love defense, but uh, we did it so much and we took so much pride in it that it didn't take long before they both loved it as much as you and I. So, um, But I taught them everything I knew. I mean, a lot of the stuff I came up with as far as defensive alignments – was because of them. I mean, I had the world at my hands. I was like, we can actually do this, you know, look at her feet and her arm and her brains and her, and you know, our catchers always had a good arm. So whether it was first and third plays or steel coverages or bunt coverages, we had a lot of options. And so I messed with it a lot rather than, you know, planning a defense because of a deficiency you know, in someone's feet or arm or, you know, decision-making or whatever, I had all of it at my fingertips. And so we, the sky was the limit on what we could try and do. And so even when they went and played, you know, with some other players from some other programs, they're like, coach, nobody does the stuff we did. Like I had to teach them. And I says, well, you don't always have the personnel. And if you strike out 15 kids a game, like some of those programs, then you don't have to be as magical with what you do. But we were striking out two or three per game. So we had to make 20 outs a lot of times on defense. So it was something that we spent a lot of time doing and enjoyed it and, and really learned a lot about the game because of what they could do. So if anything, now we recruit, you know, based on the feet and the brains that they had and, 
hopefully we can do a lot more configuring like that again. Well, you look like a genius now, moving Hannah to second. <laughs> you saw it short. Like now you look like you just knew all along exactly what would happen. They'd both be Olympians, the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely did not know that. As a matter of fact, I remember having a conversation with Anissa at the end of her sophomore year because she was working her way down the hitting lineup and she'll probably hate me for telling this story, but like the end of the year meeting when you're like, you know that you have some good kids coming in that are going to push them for their position. I'm like, hey, you're, you hate that you've moved down to like seventh in the lineup or eighth. I go, you know what you're going to hate even more is coming back this fall and uh, you're sitting some games in and out of the lineup with some of these new kids. So it's time. I know you've never been someone that really wanted to do a lot of training in the summer, but it's time or else you'll regret it. And kind of, um, I didn't threaten her, but I challenged her to come in better than she's leaving. And It was the first time, I think, that she spent some time in the summer really serious about it and felt like her spot was threatened. And uh, she did nothing but go up from that fall on and, you know, two back-to-back super regionals for us. And then uh, she continued, uh, like, it's like she found the love of the game because she put a little more effort in. She was always so talented. So that wasn't ever in question. It was just like, do you love it enough to train at a high level so that we could go bigger places and you can bat third? And, and she did all those things. I just had to poke her a little bit. So it worked. It was, it was lucky that it worked, but it worked. Well, it's a good example of what happens or what can happen when you invest like that. Um, but that, and that's your job, right? Your job is to poke a little bit when you, when you see things, you know, but yeah, I always wanted more out of her, but I knew that when I saw her frustrated with the move down to seven, I knew that it actually could get a lot worse if she didn't like start to um, appreciate the fact that she's in the lineup still and our team's getting better. Whether you get better or not, we're going places. So like, let's go, like get going. And I don't know why, she, I don't know what she did that summer or how she changed the mindset, um, but she did all the hard stuff. I just, I just spoke the truth to it, you know, clear is kind is what we always hear around here. So I was clear about it. It's, it could get worse if you don't get it going. So, and she did. So she's the one that did all the work. Um, I have the easiest job. Well, I love that clear is kind. It's true. We don't always love it in practice, like when it actually is happening, but it's very true. It's very, very true. Yeah. And I I also loved that you said, back to that triple play against Oklahoma because like I was like you maybe not literally as like physically like jumping out of the dugout kind of thing like you but inside I was like so fired up but I love that you said you got all kinds of text messages from former infielders that you had Hannah and Anissa included because that is something that you guys have drawn up and practiced and then you actually got to execute in a game which was so cool yeah yeah we talk about it a lot I always joke that we turned so many double plays because we had a lot of people on base and then they hit the ball hard. So you can't have double plays without those crummier things happening. But, um, you know, the reality was we trained to turn double plays a lot. And when we got in that situation with a runner at first and second and nobody out, we did talk about, hey, you know, if we just get a ground ball to third, and then, you know, and and make sure it's not someone that bunts in this situation right here that we can sit back. Hey, let's get a triple play. And and it was always a good time out to call and go talk about it because it put positive things in their head. And that's all I was out there doing, really. I mean, it's not like at practice we run triple plays all the time, but we did practice double plays a lot and we did get it in the game a lot. And I work with my the third baseman a lot on – knowing which way to get at least a double play, you know, in that situation. One ground ball to you says at least two outs. But, you know, we can pinch the, you know, the second baseman up the middle right now and we can sit you back on the bag. So, um, and the pitcher is like, I know how to get a ball over there, you know, especially someone like Hallie in that game. She's good at getting ground balls over there. So, yeah, we talked about a lot. We probably turned – you know, two dozen double plays after a timeout like that, that I've called where let's get a triple play. But that's why the text messages came is because 
you know, we, we would, I would come out and we'd say, Hey, why not? Let's get a triple play. And, and if you get a ground ball to your left, then turn two up the middle. And I remember the first time we did that and it really stood out and it was something people talked about was at a Tennessee regional. They had first and second and nobody out. And, um, you know, I don't think the game was put away. I know they beat us, but it, it was close. And it's first and second. It's looking bad. And we called a timeout, and my third baseman got a ground ball to her left, and we turned two and then left that girl at third base with two outs, got a fly ball or something. And it was like to keep a great team like that from scoring in an inning like that because of the fact that you work on double plays and talk about big things happening with first and second and nobody out – I mean, you can turn a game around. I mean, we just didn't hit it enough to turn that game around. But I think that I remember that play in particular because even the weeklies talked about it after we we lost. They says, hey, defensively, they, we got to get the ball out, you know, in the outfield or this team's going to get two outs at a time. Well, it was the no hesitation part, to your point, because you guys had talked about it. It was – I think for me, that's what I love to see too, is when defense, of course, I was an infielder like you, so I'm obviously very focused on that part, but knowing that there is preparation before every single pitch, like you already are thinking about like different scenarios that could happen. You're assuming it's hit to you and what are you going to do? And when you see that that was clearly the case, right? And then there was like no hesitation because you had already done that prep work. That's what, what I love also. So it was like that piece of it that was so fun also. Right. And that's why you saw me practically on the field <laughs> before we even yes. made that last out on the triple play because as soon as Juju grabbed that ball at third and got rid of it and I saw my second baseman across the bag like for that catch because she, to be across the bag, you know, instead of behind the bag right there with how fast that ball came to her, I mean – you can't blink or you'll miss that. And she was on time. So I saw it coming. So I was almost on the field by the time they completed it. But yeah, my phone blew up. That was a fun day. But you're right. I mean, the game, you can decide whether to switch gears real quick and go, okay, new situation and think of it as a positive and here's the new play and here's the new situation and, and think of it, you know, as a, okay, new plan. Um, or you can dwell on what just happened and then just get gut pinched again and again and again. So I like the former. I like the first one where we just, um, okay, new plan. Oh, and by the way, we practiced this a lot. Like this week, remember, we did this situation over and over. We repped this. So why don't you get us a ground ball over here? I can do that, you know. And then it it works out nice when you have a plan and can execute it. It just it feels less scary when you go out and tell them about a plan because we all get stuck in our feelings. So, but you can also switch that for them, go out and say, our, our sports psych person calls that like red light, green light, you know, yellow light kind of stuff. And when I see them in this like red light mode, I'm like, no, no, this isn't going to work. So go out and give them a plan so that they get out of that red light and at least into the yellow light. And before we throw another pitch, because you know, it, no one can be in the green light the whole time, but can certainly talk people out, out of being, you know, just I'm done. I'm tapped out and red light, red light, red light. <laughs> so that's my job. And I've seen good things happen in some bad situations with some positive thoughts and some plans. So we just hope for that. Well, that's the thing that I see and that I hear a lot when talking with you and just seeing the program and having competed against the program, right? Always very scrappy, but I feel like this emphasis almost on the little things or like on the fundamentals in terms of just making things happen, whether that's defensively, right? Like you're talking about making the magic happen defensively or yes, putting down a beautifully executed bunt and just moving runners over and kind of doing your job and trying to manufacture. I appreciate that about Utah softball because sometimes, you know, you see some of these other programs, they just kind of rely on the home runs. And then when they face a good pitcher, all of a sudden it's like, Oh, what do we do? And people don't bun as much, I will say, too. And But I see you guys really just trying to make things move. And that that is fun to watch, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to have a whole bunch of home run hitters and do it the other way. It sounds a lot easier. 
Um, but that's not, I, I mean, it's not like we don't try to recruit those kids, but we have had to manufacture runs way more than just put together double, double, double. So, you know, I built a giant softball stadium here so that we can create a few more things for some speed kids, some triple gaps on both sides of the center fielder rather than just on the one side. And we've even had some in the park home runs because our field's so big, but it really opens up the opportunity for some, you know, multi-skilled kids, you know, the kids that can run and steal and slap and and um, you can't just put a home run hitter in right field and think that they're not going to get beat up by my, you know, slappers that can slice a gap. And if you play it wrong, I score on an in the park home run. So I I built that park with us in mind because of our scrappiness. And I used to get a little offended by the scrappy thing, but it is so true. That is who we are and what we do. And um, you know, Hannah really was part of that group that when this field was built, um, helped us break the triples record. And, um, because, and honestly, just a regular base hit to the left fielder, since you have to play so deep, if you don't hit it really hard or they have to travel, you know, towards the line and you out of the box are thinking double, those are doubles. And, and, it's been fun to, we got to host regionals and, you know, teams from Mississippi came. And anyway, the first time the Pac-12 teams came and didn't understand how to play our field, and we did, it was really a speed game. And, and I see Stanford doing that with their field too. They have some, a couple of big gaps and, and out of the box, they're thinking triple on a ball in the left center gap and, and a double on a, you know, one in the, that even they pick up clean. It's just it's too big of a park. So, yeah, I think that we have to look for those extra bases, picking a change up out of a pitcher's glove, um, all those things so that we can steal. We do a ton of those things, and and it's been fun. Um, we have some players that are really engaging in that side of the game, and and uh, that's fun to coach. I enjoy that. We, we had two men's fast switch players as coaches, you know, the last bunch of years with Cody and Russ, and – in their game, they couldn't get a hit if they didn't pick, you know, a grip and know what pitch was coming. And it was just too dominated by pitching. So they're really good at picking that. And I've kind of grown up around the men's game with my older brother playing and my former high school coach playing it. So I, that's, that's a fun side of the game for me. So you're right. If we have to call it scrappy, then I'm going to own it and love it, but it's what we do. And whatever it takes to win games. That's a good call out though, because some people think of scrappy or maybe use it. And there's this <laughs> implication that you're like coming from behind. That is, so maybe scrappy is not the right word, but it's the sentiment of it. Cause to me, the way I think of it with Utah is just aggressive. Like there's pressure constantly. You are constantly mm-hmm. putting pressure on people, whether it's you're putting pressure on the defense or whatever it is. It is just pitch after pitch after pitch <laughs> You're competing. That's how it feels to me to where it's like, when you do that, something good is going to happen, you know, at some point. So it's almost like you force the other teams to not be able to take a single pitch off. That's how I have viewed Utah. Yeah. Yeah. We use it a lot. I I don't hate the name. I had to get used to it because at first I took offense to it, but I'm not a hothead kid anymore. (laughs) So I don't take offense to it. And I actually have used it. It's also grit. We use, we talk about being a pest, like our slappers in a one, two count that are just like a pest. They're just like foul it off, foul it off, foul it off. And then they bring them an inside pitch and they dribble it and they're safe. And it's like just outlast, outwit and outlast. And um, so it can be gritty. It can be a, just be a pest, be a, um, be scrappy and, and it's fine. We'll, we'll get our doubles, we'll get our knocks. But, um, if we're consistently, like you said, not letting teams take a pitch off cause we're not taking a pitch off, then yeah, I'm proud of that. I like that that might go along with our name. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, especially in the pack too, you know, like it's such a grind. And I know we talked about this briefly before too, where it's like, Utah has been the pack for 10 years, which is crazy that it's already been that long. Um, But just the competing every single weekend 
it's like you, I feel like that's already in the Utah DNA. So it allows you to just always compete. Yeah. And, and I don't, at first when we got in the conference, I didn't see a lot of the Arizona's and UCLA's be scrappy. I certainly don't think anyone would have said that to them, that they're scrappy. And so, um, you know, at first we were getting beat by double digit runs. And then, you know, I mean, our first goal was go to the sixth inning and seventh inning with a team. And then it was, okay, score in multiple innings. Okay. We've now put up one run in the second, one in the fourth, one in the sixth, but none of them are crooked numbers. They're putting up crooked numbers. So then the goal between became put up some crooked numbers and our program really developed and grew out of losing to really good teams. Um, so we lost and got better and lost and got better. And the only time that I was frustrated with my team is when they lost and didn't get better. I'm like, I can't write a practice plan better than bringing Arizona in town and competing against them and facing three first and third situations and two possible squeeze situations. And like, that's like the best day of practice ever. If you use it as, um, a platform to get better. And we grew our program by losing and competing for hopefully a full practice, you know, seven innings of learning rather than just five, you know, and before you knew it, we were winning some of those games. And then before you knew it, we won a couple of series and, and then they were starting to hide their pitches better and not throwing changeups when we might seal or whatever and all of a sudden, the tables turned a little bit. I'm like, hey, they're actually prepping to deal with our scrappiness. This is fun, earning some respect. And But, you know, talent-wise, to compete, you know, every day against the best, um, you should be getting better even if you don't win. And our program has elevated just with being in that conference with them. So we're, we feel blessed. And the only time I got mad at my team was after Hannah and Anissa left, I felt like we were used to winning a little bit. And so then they're like, well, we lost this game. And then it's the third inning. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, it doesn't matter if you feel like we don't have a shot to win. We don't stop getting better and um, never stop. So um, there was some hard years in there trying to teach some kids who were used to winning and, and that gave up in the third. Whereas my in years past, we, we just barely got started with practice by the third inning. So, and I didn't talk about it like it was practice. I competed to have a chance to win, but we never stopped because we knew we were getting better. So, and I think the other coaches in the pack appreciated that and, uh, and started preparing to try to beat us rather than just, oh, it's, it's just Utah. And, you know, they're kind of holding us back actually with RPI they never said that, but I always thought, you know, I want to earn my keep around here. And that was my only way to do it with the talent we had. We had to fight. Well, and I've appreciated watching you fight. Cause like I said, I just feel like there's from, from the second that I got to play against Utah in the pack, there was just this energy about, about the team, about the program. And I do think that obviously something that contributes to that is the fact that you're an alum at your alma mater, right? So you literally walk this path and there's just a different level of investment, different level of probably respect, relatability, all the things with the women that you're now coaching. Yeah, I. it's a ton about that. I mean, they awarded me the other day because I passed the other head coaches in the win column, had no idea that was coming, didn't really care, but it was a cool excuse to bring out some of those coaches that I, that were also alum, you know, Joe couldn't come obviously cause she's coaching at A&M, but, um, Norma Carr was our first coach and she's who I just passed in wins and she's an alum and, and, um, you know, just, she just, she is Utah softball. Norma is, I, um, so she's the, her name is on the office I'm sitting in right now, the Norma Carr alumni room. And, um, and Mona Stevens who hired me, who gave me my first chance as a coach here. Um, I was an assistant for her and she was the other most winningest coach. And, 
yeah, there's a lot of pressure on me to continue to make them proud. I mean, those are the people that I feel like are going to start blowing up my phone if we're not representing well. So I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit afraid of them. Um, and rightfully so. I mean, so I'm fearful of what would happen if I stopped um, any of the things that I think it takes to, to make this program, you know, be a reputable place. So, but yeah, out there representing them, winning games, gritty, and uh, our alum is that they're more integrated now than ever um, into what we're doing. And there, a lot of them didn't get to play in the pack, but watching us compete in the pack, we have, we have some fun uh, events with alum that come out and in full force. So it, it's good times. I think we can all rest easy and know that you're never going to stop doing the things that, you know, (laughs) it, it takes to no, no, I'm afraid of them a little (laughs) bit. And I'm also afraid of myself. I don't think I would allow myself. There's no, like, I never felt like there was pressure from my administration um, that was any more than the pressure I already give myself. So, you know, if I start getting soft, then I'm out. You know, if I don't have that desire or that edge or my body just can't take it anymore, then I'm out. But, um, you know, we just hired Charmel Green. She's one of our higher ups, our chief operating officer. And she is amazing. She was a senior when I was a freshman and bossed me every day. I was a player that year and she was team captain and all American. And now she's high up in our administration. And yeah, I've got her now day in and day out, making sure that we got it. She's not easy either. She's like, don't think just because I'm your teammate and your friend on the weekends that I'm not going to, you know, fire you if you stop doing your work. And (laughs) I'm, it was the first time I felt like, wow, maybe administration is harder on me than I'm on myself. But she's um, she's got an eye on it too. But yeah, there's only one way to do it. So I'll uh, I'll quit when my body's just too tired to keep up. I love it's so true too. I love that those dynamics kind of never change. Like the upperclassmen with the underclassmen, and even like the coaching to player dynamic. Like it doesn't even matter how how old you are, where you are in life. For some reason, it kind of there's always that that same dynamic to a certain degree. <laughs> yeah, I'll see players that played for me like 20 years ago. They're like, "Hey, coach," and I'm like, "That's actually not my name." <laughs> like, in, you can actually, but there is a respect level. You're right; that kind of never goes away. So, which is nice. Yeah. So, and I have the utmost respect for Norma Carr and Mona Stevens and Joe Evans and and for Sharmel Green, who was you know, still is running the world. Like she's just amazing. And whatever nugget she can give me to help our program, I'm going to be all ears. Yeah. Is there anything about Utah softball that you feel like people don't know about enough? I think maybe some of that. I mean, you know, we weren't, there weren't very many programs that were playing in the eighties and we were, and you know, especially with the hype with the SEC and and building big stadiums and paying them more than the other conferences. And so they came on the scene like big time and hard and strong. But the history of this place and the people it started with, with like Fern Gardner, who ran our um, athletic department, along with Chris Hill, I mean, the two of them ran it forever. And they had a vision and they didn't stop. And Chris continued all the way till we were in the PAC 12. I mean, he had ideas of that happening um, long before we got an invite, you know? And so we had the core group of not just softball, but you know, our university, they don't just let anyone in the PAC 12. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we got invited and it wasn't just sports. So it is a great place to go to school. It's there's a great like rich history um, here that when young women come in to our program, I mean, we just got done writing letters to our alum. Um, we did it last year because of the pandemic stuff. We couldn't meet with them and have a dinner, so we just matched up players with an alum and we wrote letters and 
we did it again this year just because um, we wanted to invite them out to stuff and we already had their addresses and let's just do this. And, um, and they had told me that they appreciated it. So the connecting with alum, this alumni room that I'm sitting in right now is, was built by our alum. Like they paid for it. We just have this space at our stadium that was kind of a storage room. And at our 40th, um, reunion that we had a big blowout reunion. It was awesome. Um, we asked alum to give back and build this room. And I think it was 80 grand or something that it cost. And this space is now it's right next to the concession stand, but it's like a, essentially a tailgate spot. I mean, without the alcohol, but they get to come in prior to the game or stay after the game and in this room. And the people that played her 40 years ago or more are milling around with the kids that graduated last year. And so connecting them, not just socially and for the games as a fan base, but for jobs. I mean, Mm. some of them have been good career links for our players. And so those are the types of things that I think go unnoticed if you don't have an hour long podcast that you get to talk about everything. (laughs) So this is awesome. But those are the things that I, I feel most proud about the other day when they gave that award to me, it was considered alumni day. And I'm like, wait, I have to call my people because every one of those alum is like on my phone. They're all my people. I either coached them or played with them yeah. or worked for them or, you know, what, I mean, all, every single one of the head coaches here, I have a personal connection with. And so I'm like, if it's an alumni day, I have to call all of them and invite them. Yeah. And they says, we got it this time. Like it was all this big secret thing. So I didn't get to be a part of it, but this is a, um, this is a program that is, is family and it is, um, it's small and maybe less publicized, but more deep and, and pretty real when it comes to some of the things that we have opportunity to do and we are doing. See, this is why I love talking to you, coach. I'm always like fired up and more energized afterwards. <laughs> well, there's so much we can do with this platform, right? Yeah. And because I'm old and I get bored with the same old stuff, you know, we just, we, we try to find ways to do things um, that are maybe different or, I mean, they present themselves, right? When you have these wonderful alum that are running these companies and I can connect them with my business, you know, master's degree kids, I'm going to do it. So we've, we've done some of those speaker events where they come and tell them about what they're doing in the real world and how they can help connect them. I'm all I have to do is set up a date with them. We have four hours of practice time we're allowed to do. We can have an hour of that. So, and we need to do more of that with COVID. We kind of got away from a little bit of that, but um, being creative is, is mostly because I get bored. So (laughs) I've been creative. We know you need that challenge always. And I love that about you. (laughs) Always. always. And a staff that's bought into that too. You know, I think that, um, you know, if it was a hundred percent only and all about winning, then no one would want, I mean, they wouldn't like coaching with me, you know, DJ and, um, and Paige and Chip, they appreciate those things too. And maybe like you like saw the program from a distance and, knew that we did things a little bit different, but didn't quite know what it was. And those are the types of things that I think I want to be known for that we do a few more of those things and make sure that we're not just getting better that, but we're having fun playing this game that we love. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you saying that too. You're like, yep, we bring in the, the new staff members, get those perspectives, but there are certain things like that, that are always going to be Utah softball. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we. I feel a great responsibility to um, empower women to go out and be able to do the world. And the world's getting harder, not easier to do. So the amount of time that we're prepping them for the world um, grows every year. And the game's getting harder too, but I there's just something that I'm not willing to do, and that is be at senior day and see a kid off and go, Oh dear God, she's going to, life's going to hand it to her. She's going to be dosed. Like I want to feel confident that their confidence in themselves and what 
they've learned not just how to hit doubles, but some of the character training we do, that that's going to loom big for them and help them succeed in whatever they choose next. It's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, coach, I could literally talk to you all day if I had my way, <laughs> but I will respect your time and I'll just, we can wrap up with a little game that I play with everyone who comes on the show. Um, it's called Safer Out. And basically I'll just bring something up and if, if you like it or you agree with it, you call it safe. If you don't, you'll call it out. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Sure. So first one is pushing the start date of the season back like later than it currently is. Safer out. Safe. I had a feeling, right? Because all of the schools that have to deal with weather, you know, like it's difficult. Yeah, it's not just the this, this schools and the weather either. It's, you know, these athletes want to go to – class in person and which means that it should be a little more balanced the teams that are on the road us road warriors like we're figuring out how to do it but at the end of the day it is more difficult for these kids to do their academic schedule when we're at airports more than everyone else and so it's a disadvantage to them academically as well so it's and and also the fan bases are growing and I'm not getting more fans when it's 40 degrees at our first home game so all of it benefits. That's an easy answer for me. It's safe. So yep. let's push it back. Yep. Yep. I get it. I agree. All right. Cool. That was the first one. Second one is name image likeness or players getting paid. Safer out. Safe. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know much about it um, because that's someone else's um, job, thankfully, because it sounds like a big job to try to manage that. But I've never been a fan of limiting opportunities um, unless someone has a really good reason why there's negative. So just because I don't understand it or because I think it might distract from what we're doing as a team, it's just another challenge possibly for me. But that's fine if the athletes get a chance to have benefits from it and it can impact their future, then I need to be on board and I am. Yep. Yep. That's that growth mindset you got coach in play again. I like it. I like it. Okay. And then the last one is bat flips safer out. I'm going to have to go with out on that one, but not because I don't, I think it's bad. Other programs do it. Um, because I think every program has their own way of doing things and they're allowed to. So I don't care if other teams do it. I just don't want our team to do it. Um, I love the excitement level um, that they have. Um, and But we've never been someone that likes to put all the focus on one person. And that absolutely does. Yep. So since we're such a team aspect kind of mentality here, um, I'd rather the point and rush type of Abby Walmack way because it's more saying, yeah, I hit that ball, but my pitching coach over there threw those pitches to me this week, or my hitting coach told me that pitch was coming. Like I'm a big fan of how do we give some other people the attention? Um, that's more of the team aspect to me. But again, I don't hate it when other teams do it. Other programs can run it the way they want to. Yep. So I love that, like full circle there with with the Abby Wambach book. That is on my list too. I got to read it. You've inspired me yeah. again. I, I got to move it up the list. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. Well, thank you so much, Coach. This was awesome. I knew it would be. Honestly, it's why I asked you to be on the show. But it it exceeded expectations, and I, I appreciate your time. This was great. It's fun. Anytime. Love love what you're doing to help grow our sport. I mean, having your face on every week with someone and really. Just it, the exposure we're getting, you know, is because of kids like you. I'm going to call you a kid um, because it's, you know, this is what's happening. This is why it's growing. It's because people can see it more. So please keep doing what you're doing. It's fantastic. And we both love the sport so much. And I'll keep doing this. You keep doing that because um, this is more for you. <laughs> uh, but keep doing it. You're great at it. I appreciate what you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And deal. I'll make that deal with you, coach. We'll both keep going. Yeah. <laughs>
Awesome. All right. Thanks. Go you. Amy Hogue's so cool. <laughs> I just like, I come across these coaches during calls prepping for broadcasts. And lots of times I find myself thinking like, man, she's cool. Like I'm learning a lot and I want to talk to her more, you know? And so then I end up having them on the podcast and it's just, it's the energy, the mindset, the drive. I, I just get fired up and then I want to share that with you. So we do. And you know, now here we are. But with that said, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about not playing the name game. And everyone knows what the name game is. It's when you're playing a team that people are talking about, they're just so good. Oh my gosh, they're unbeatable, blah, blah, blah. Or it could even be the opposite too. Like maybe it's a team where their record or their stats aren't very good on paper, or maybe nobody's really heard of them. Either way, playing the name game is when you let this affect you. And it's bad because it means you've changed your approach to the game. Like either you're playing an OU type team and you're way too tight and you're tense and you overthink it to the point where you change things that maybe have been working for you. Or you're playing a team at the bottom of their conference who's under 500 or whatever it is and you let up and maybe lose focus a little bit. But either way, it's just it's bad because you're no longer playing your game or respecting the game, really. Because to respect the game means you should bring the same intensity either way to every single opponent. So the great ones, they never do this. They never lose that. You know, for example, Stanford was unranked at the time, right? When they beat number two at the time, UCLA. They didn't shut them out by worrying about the 25 game win streak and, oh my gosh, these are some of the best pitchers in the country or, and they're undefeated in the pack. Like, They won by sticking to their plan on every pitch. That's how it happened. And Oklahoma being undefeated, they are on this entire year because no matter what team they've played, they never got lazy and thought they could just show up and win. No, they continue to compete. That's why they now have the longest winning streak of all time, 36 and counting. It actually overcame UCLA's old record of 35, right? That's why it happened. So this game is just a roller coaster. And Kelly, I said it last week, the game has a sick sense of humor sometimes. It does. I'd never really like expressed it in that way or heard it that way, but she's right. But so does life. Believe me, you know, and hearing Coach Hogue say she was hesitant about the word scrappy was interesting because I think of it as a compliment. But you know what it is? Maybe it's not just being scrappy. Maybe it's actually being relentless. Like no matter who or what is in front of you. You're just relentless because when you are, things happen. The universe knows. You put the right energy out, you're going to get the right energy back. Even if it's hard sometimes and maybe not exactly how you imagined it, it's worth it. So that's it. Never play the name game. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, part of the Believe Network and presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you listen, including Believe.com. And you can watch the videos on YouTube, too. Subscribe, rate, and write a review for the show. I always appreciate your support and hearing what you think. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. You can always reach out to me on Twitter at JennaBacera01 and Instagram at JennaBacera as well. As always, thank you for tuning in and catch you soon.